A very warm welcome. This is Reflections, our devotional Bible study. Presently, we're in a series on the book of James. We'll be uh, looking at James chapter 4, so if you have a Bible and would like to follow along, that would be wonderful. Uh, James is about living a Christian life that's uh, in balance. So let's see what uh, he has to say in chapter 4 today. Well, we always begin with one of the great hymns of the faith, Today, um, that well-known hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Through many dangers, toils, and stairs, I have already become His grace has brought me safe thus far. pick it up in chapter 4 today. I'm going to start with verse 7, but the verses we will be focusing on is verse uh, 11 and 12. And I'll point that out when we get there, our focus verses. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you up. And now our focus, verse 11 and 12. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy you, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? It was a five-year-old Andrew pulled out his kindergarten class picture describing each classmate. Oh, this is Robert. He hits everyone. Uh, and Stephen never listens to the teacher. Oh, Mark chases us and is very noisy. Then he points to his own picture. Oh, that is me. I'm just sitting here minding my own business. Um. Uh, James' lesson today is how to deal with the issue of playing God. You know, playing God is pretty risky when you think about it. Uh, he calls it slander. What is slander? Well, he says, brothers, do not slander one another. Slander means not to speak down on somebody. It's speaking of someone in a way that lowers that person's reputation in the eyes of others. Uh, it's non-redemptive criticism. It wishes to be heard, but does nothing to restore. It sets oneself up as the authority rather than God. You know, I find interesting slander and devil are the same word. In fact, the word devil means slander. 
The Bible calls Satan the accuser and slanderer of Christians. Isn't that not the devil's number one activity, putting people down? We're most like the devil when we slander. What is it about slander that's so alluring? Well, 60 Minutes tried to answer that question. They sent a news team to report on the remarkable sale of all the cheap grocery store tabloids. They interviewed people who were buying the paper at grocery stores and checkout counters. A reporter asked one buyer, do you people really believe what you read in the paper? The reply was, no, but we like to read it anyway. What are some examples of this? Well, I call this slander in the first degree. Do you know what they're doing? It's a statement of judgment on them. Now, now stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, don't mean to be critical. I shouldn't say this about them. And what is said might be absolutely true, but it still harms them. Then there's slander in the second degree. Well, let's just keep this between else, but between us, okay? You know, and there's times we, we're, we're called to speak about others, but the goal must to be to build up and, and motive to glorify God. You know, most are unaware when they slander others. A child's going on the way to school he said to his dad, look at that van. Why did they do that? It's ugly. The father said, "Are you, you are the standard of ugliness? Maybe you want to say that does not look good to me. Yes, most are unaware of slandering others. Maybe you want to, uh, we, we just don't see we are uh, talking down to them. It's, it's, uh, we kind of have blinders. Dr. Albert Crantrell, professor of Princeton University, conducted a series of experiments. He wanted to demonstrate how quickly rumors spread, so he called six students to his office in strict confidence. He informed them the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were planning to attend the university dance. Within a week, that completely fictitious story had reached never, nearly every student on campus. City officials called the university upset not being informed. Press agencies called for details. He wrote later, that was a pleasant rumor. A slanderous one travels even faster. Now, when you think about it, the slanderer and the assassin differ only in the weapon they use. With the one, the dagger, the other, the tongue. Of course, the former is worse than the latter. The last only kills the body, while the other murders the reputation. So slander is to talk down. And you say, well, why is it so serious? Well, James describes, first of all, it's unloving. Because when you speak against a brother or judges him, it speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, not keeping it, you sit in judgment on it. Uh, judges remind us of the, the Pharisees who ran people down while at the same time acted as judge and jury. A man said to a pastor, well, I don't have but one talent. The pastor said, well, what's your talent? The man replied, the gift of criticism. The pastor responded, the guy who had only one talent went out and buried it. Maybe that's what you ought to do with yours. See, those who judge, they speak against the law. So what law is being broken? James says it's the royal law. Back in chapter 2, verse 8, the law of love. You know, love your neighbor. Now, Jesus does not mean never to hold any opinions or refuse to discern between truth and error. Certainly, if something is wrong, we need to speak the truth in love. You know, carry a sword with velvet gloves. And our judgment is to be careful not to violate the law of love by putting them down before others. You see, our goal as believers is to be the building up of one another in love, not tearing them down. 
There was a lady who bought a book to read and a package of cookies while waiting for her plane. The man one seat away fumbled to open a package of cookies in the seat between them. Shocked a stranger would eat her cookies, she just reached over and took one and ate it. Man didn't say anything, but soon reached over and took another, so she took another too. When they were down to one cookie, the man reached over, broke the cookie in half, got up and left. The lady couldn't believe the man's nerve, but soon the announcement came to board the plane. Still angry and puzzling over the incident, she reached into her purse for her tissue. There in her purse lay her unopened package of cookies. Kind of unloving, isn't it? And it's also then unjustified. James went on to say there's only one lawgiver and judge, and we're not him. Lawgiver is used six times in the Old Testament and only one time in the New Testament. It always refers to God. Only God has the right to judge. In fact, that's part of God's job description, not ours. So James is asking, who do you think you are? Do you think you can play God? That's why he says there's only one able to save and destroy. There's only one God, and we're not God. So to save and destroy summarizes God's supreme right and power that belongs to him alone. There was a young couple moved into a neighborhood. A woman saw her neighbor hanging wash outside. Oh, that laundry's not very clean. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. The husband remained silent. A month later, she was surprised to see how clean the wash was on the line. She thought, said out loud, who taught her how to wash correctly? The husband said, oh, I got up early and cleaned our windows. So it is with life. What we see when watching others depend on, depends on the window through which we're looking. Well, the window of God's word says Judging others or to, to play God is unjustified and unloving. Jesus would later say in Matthew 7, 3 to 5, <clears throat> Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, James or Jesus makes a point with humor. Hebrew humor uses exaggeration. I bet the disciples chuckled because Jesus is saying, it's unjustified to judge when it blinds me to my own faults. In a Phoenix comic strip, Linus asks Lucy, why are you always so anxious to criticize me? Lucy said, I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. Linus said, what about your own faults? And Lucy responded, I have a knack for overlooking them. See, we tend to exaggerate the failing of others while we minimize our own failures. Playing God is simply unloving and unjustified any way you look at it. So what are its important truths to remember when we're tempted to judge or tempted to play God. <clears throat> First of all, we'll be judged by the same standards we use to judge. Je Jesus said in, in before uh, the two verses before uh, the speck of sawdust in, your, sawdust in your brother's eye, he says in verse 1 and 2 of chapter Matthew 7, Do not judge or you too will be judged. Same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus tells us, by the standards we set for others, we will be judged. So when attempt to play God, remember what we dish out, we're going to get in return. There was a lawyer who loved to attack his opponents through critical letters printed in the newspaper. Well, in 1842, he ridiculed the wrong man. James Shields did not take kindly to the writer. Shields tracked down this attorney who 
public embarrassed him and challenged him to a duel. Well, the lawyer was not a fighter, but chose swords in hopes of using his long arms to his advantage. He trained with a West Point graduate as he prepared to fight to the death. At the last minute, others intervened and convinced the men to stop. The lawyer returned to his practice a changed man. Never again did he openly criticize anyone. Years later, when his wife criticized the South in the Civil War, you know how President Lincoln responded? He said, don't criticize them. They're just what we would be under similar circumstances. How true we weep, reap what we sow. Now, the words of Jesus are worth remembering when you say, and we've also been shown great mercy <clears throat> by God in our lives. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. Oh, that amazing grace we just sing about and we'll reflect on again in just a moment. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Uh, his grace leads us home. His grace guides us. His grace empowers us. Oh, how we need that grace, even in the midst of when we've been wronged or we wrong others. You know, slander feeds our deep desire to be approved and accepted by others. When we play God, we forget about who we are in Christ. You see, our approval is in Christ alone. Think about this. The more we appreciate our significance in Christ, the less likely we'll desire to play God. Let me say it again. The more we appreciate who we are in Christ, loved, forgiven, uh, empowered, uh, the less likely we'll desire to play God. I mean, if Jesus went to the cross for us and died, shed his blood, uh, it was very merciful to us when tempted to play God, we remember our identity in Jesus and his amazing mercy and grace in our lives. And that uh, helps us view the situation and others in a different light. There was a boss who gave everybody in the co company a $350 Christmas bonus. Of course, everybody praised the boss. Second year, does it again. Another $350. Everybody was elated. Well, by the third Christmas, Many spent the money and thought, what's he going to do this year? Well, if he didn't give it, you'd be upset because we've been conditioned to be ungrateful or we live in a, an entitlement society and world. Were we to be merciful because God has been merciful to us? That's why we're merciful. None of us really gets what we deserve. In fact, the longer we're Christians, it's the more we can take his mercy and grace for granted. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot performer at air shows, returned to San Diego for a show. However, at 300 feet in the air, both engines stopped suddenly. Well, with great skill, he managed to land the plane. And although it was badly damaged, no one was hurt. As he suspected, the World War II prop plane had been fueled with jet fuel instead of gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who fueled the plane. Well, the young man was sick with agony for his mistake. Tears rolled down his face as Hoover approached. He caused the loss of a very expensive plane and endangered the lives of several people. Well, Bob didn't scold or criticize him, but instead, Bob put his arm around him and said, to show you, I'm sure you'll never do this again. I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow. How's that for great mercy and grace? You know, when all Jesus' disciples forsook him when he was arrested, he could have criticized them. 
Well, after the resurrection, the record shows he never did. Why? Mercy is the way of Jesus. I remember four frames, an old picture story taken from a Life magazine in the late 1960s. In the first frame, we see a little house in the middle of a wheat field. The sun's going down. A young boy is wandering out of the house into the cold night. In the second frame, you see people racing back and forth through the field in search of the little boy. The attitude among the people is one of panic. The third frame, the sun begins to rise. People join hands as they walk through the field. In the final frame, the father is carrying the limp form of his son into the house. Underneath the fourth frame are the only words found in the picture story. The caption read, if we had only joined hands a little sooner. Well, as we join hands in the, with the people of God, the people of faith, the, as a rich mercy of God empowers us to treat the family of God well. It's, we're called to support one another and build one another up in Christ Jesus. What a difference it makes as we support fellow residents and staff, saying a, a kind word, an uplifting word. May none of us have to say if we had only joined hands a little sooner. That's why we have the privilege of calling today, today, the cherishing that great, amazing grace God has in our lives as he's loved us and forgiven us and calls us his forgiven child. May we treasure that amazing grace and share it abundantly with those around us. Well, we, we began with amazing grace. Let's sing a couple verses of that again, and then we'll do a, a verse of God be with you till we meet again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. The Lord has promised good to me, His word. Be with you till we meet 
again. Do we meet? Do we meet? Do we meet at Jesus' feet? Do we meet? Do we meet? I'd be with you. Do we meet again? Well, may God be with you till we meet again. And as a great hymn said previously, his grace has brought me safe this far. His grace will lead me home. May the abundance of God's grace and mercy be with you till we meet again.